Hi guys, my name is Robert Feranek. I'm from Federal Academy and uh, in this video we are going to speak about PCB manufacturing. Basically, why I created this video? Mm, it's because uh, when you are designing boards, I think it is very useful to know some information about PCB manufacturing. And I had this opportunity to visit uh, Sierra Circuits company. They do a couple of different uh, things, but one of the things they do is uh, PCB manufacturing. And uh, during my visit, I recorded a couple of hours of video. From these couple of hours, I, uh, I created, uh, I think, around 19 short video clips about the most interesting topics which I really found uh, like uh, wow or or the topics which I think uh, you can find interesting or you can find useful yeah maybe you can learn something new from this and I'm telling you even I didn't know some of the things just to give you an idea what is going to be inside of this video yeah I'm I'm going to make a small teaser so you don't go away or you don't switch on this video. This is what will be some of the clips about. The first one is going to be about drilling. And uh, the interesting fact what I learned about the drilling is with six mil drill bit, you can only drill hundred holes. Wow. This is important, yeah? If you are designing boards, and if it's not necessary to use 6 mil drill bit, maybe you don't want to use it because it can make your PCB cheaper. The other thing what I found interesting was this. Layers of PCB can move and shrink during PCB manufacturing. So, you know, when they build multi-layer PCBs and when they uh, laminate them, when they heat them up and bake them, then the layers during this process, they can move a little bit. That's okay. I was expecting moving, but shrinking. I didn't know the layers of the PCB can shrink. And the third thing what I found really interesting from all these clips, what I'm going to show you is that copper can grow between holes drilled too close to each other. So one of the reasons why you cannot drill the holes very close to each other is because the copper can grow between them. We will be speaking about this. Yeah? So watch and you will see a little bit later. Before I start the first clip, I would like to um, say that the, the clips were recorded directly inside the company. So in some of the clips, there is really strong, uh, sometimes even disturbing uh, background noise. I tried to remove it. Uh, it didn't go very well. So I just left the background noise uh, in the videos. You still can understand what we are speaking about. Just be prepared. Okay. Especially in this first video clip, the background noise is really strong. So let's do it. Let's watch the first video clip. The drilling area. And so drilling is the most costly part of manufacturing. Costly part? Yeah. Oh. Because the drill bit, every drill bit that you use, um, you can only use it a certain amount of time and then you throw it away. And that drill bit is very expensive. So just uh, for some kind of illustration, how many times you can drill approximately? For I don't. a six mil drill, you can only get a hundred times. 100 times. That's it. That's why a 6 mil drill. I saw like you say like 10,000 or. Nope, 100. That's why they're very expensive. So if you have like a 10 mil hole, then it goes into the thousand. So 6 mil, that's uh, 0 0.15 or 0. Yeah. Point. So normally it's much better if someone wants cheaper PCB, use 0 0.2. Yeah. It's all quiet now. 
So next time when you are designing uh, a board, be careful about the minimum size of the hole which you use on your PCB. I think uh, if you would like to go for the cheapest PCBs in China, usually the minimum hole which they recommend is 0.3 mm. That's 12 mils. Okay, anything below 0.3 mm is going to probably increase the price of your board. In the next clip, we are going to speak about the slivers, something like what you can see here. And also we will speak about this kind of situation when uh, you draw a track like this out of the path under this sharp angle here. From my experience, I never had uh, any problems with this kind of connection, but uh, you will see they will mention that uh, sometimes it may become a problem. So here is the second clip. They check for um, something called uh, slivers. So if you have an island of copper that's not, that's, uh, or something that could become an island of copper during the etching process. The problem with that is that those pieces of copper, they end up coming off of the material and falling somewhere else on the panel during manufacturing, which is of course a short or an open now for sure. Can I, can I draw it here? Yeah, you can draw here, you can draw here. Like this. This would be the path and yeah. this is how it would go, yeah? And they say this is problem because this was a short clip about slivers and now we are going to speak about teardrops if you are not sure what teardrops are i'm going to show you okay watch here via tracks if you go here tools teardrops okay see this here this copper additional copper here it's called teardrops. They uh, sometimes do it, especially when this uh, annual ring is too small. They do it because in case of uh, moving uh, the hole, yeah, the hole can be moved because the layers are moved or because of the uh, drilling tolerance. If this hole is moved a little bit up here, for example here, then if you use these uh, teardrops, the connection still will be okay. If there is no teardrop and you drill the hole like here, you basically cut the connection. So this is what is the next clip about. And okay, what about the teardrops? Many people ask about teardrops. So do they need to do it in, in the layout or you do it here or why you do it? Yeah, we correct for teardrops. Um, so teardrops are important because of the drill, uh, true position the drill uh, wander. So if you are drilling a hole uh, in a pad without a teardrop, you have less, let's say, leeway or less tolerance. And if your drill bit happens to uh, land where the trace is hitting the pad, you could literally cut the connection there completely. But it's not necessary designers do it. You will... It's not necessary. We'll correct for that. Yeah, okay. That's one of the things we do in camp, the teardropping. Is there I mean, something special about the teardrops? What they, you know, some engineers they ask me, they would like to edit. You just edit, and that's, there are no special requirements for teardrops. Uh, they need to be on every track, or there's nothing special. About how big there's they need to special, be? Uh, there's no special design requirements for teardrops. You just put it, and that's it. You see this case? I add the teardrop. You see here, it's getting violation, so I cannot add. Okay. So what do you do then? Uh, we, we don't can, add the we, we don't add or we need. This is enough manual ring, so I don't have to add it. If it's uh, less than five mil, you would like to add teardrops. Mm -hmm. The important information from this video is the five mils annual ring. Yeah. If you would like to have a easy PCB manufacturing then uh, keep the annual ring, the distance between this edge of the hole to the edge of the path, this distance here, keep it uh, bigger than five mils. If you make it smaller than five mils, then uh, yeah, it's becoming more and more 
difficult for manufacturing. In the next clip, uh, I just learned new word, so I included this uh, clip because it's interesting. You will learn what does it mean to when people say edge comp, edge compensation. So for tracing space, what we do, every board shop does this. They'll take your tracing space and they'll take your trace and they'll add copper to it. So that's etch comp. Because when you etch the board, the uh, trace goes back down to the trace width that you're looking for. So if a designer says, Desi uh, manufacture the board as is, uh, and my four mil traces and my four mil spacing don't touch those, all we do is we add etch comp because that's needed for manufacturing. But we won't modify any, any of that. Will that actually result in exact, if we model that, will that actually result in the 100 ohm differential that they're looking for? And the answer is no. Hmm. Then uh, what does the impedance depends on? So there's uh, three main things that impact impedance in manufacturing. One is the etch tolerance. Okay. Two is the press out thickness of the dielectric materials. Uh, and three is how much copper area is on that layer. Okay, this was interesting. What do you think? Why it is interesting? Many people ask why they just cannot simply use this online impedance calculator or this free software to calculate uh, or design their stack up and calculate the impedances. It's because during PCB manufacturing, there are some factors which influence the impedance and these factors they are not included in these theoretical calculations therefore when you are designing a pcb which has uh, specific impedance requirements i always recommend to talk to your pcb manufacturer they should send you the final stack up they should send you the recommended track geometry okay online calculator free calculator is for you just to get some ideas about the track geometry and uh, and the impedance but you cannot get the final numbers from these simple calculators you need to ask your pcb manufacturer in the next clip we are going to speak about moving layers and uh, scaling layers during uh, pc production and we are going to use uh, two words quite often preprec and core so for everyone who doesn't know what preprec and core means i'm going to very quickly explain a uh, uh, multi-layer pcb how it is built when they build it they use three kind of materials here on the top you can see it's called copper foil so it's just copper yeah inside the pcb here they use something what is called core core is a uh, isolation or dielectricum with copper foil on the top and copper foil on the bottom it's basically like a simple two-layer pcb yeah? that's what you can see here and uh, when they would like to build a multi-layer uh, pcb they need to put something between the foil and the cores or between the cores yeah this what you can see here this something is called preprec preprec is just isolation there is no copper yeah. these are the two words that are going to be used in the next clip here it is but i've seen on some pcbs they build it like core preprec core can no. you do this no yes if you do core preprec core that's called a book construction uh, and the reason to do that is to control the thickness between layer one and two very okay. well because that's not changing that's not melting the prepreg in between is what's going to melt. So basically what only melts is the prepreg. That's and right. And core never melts. Right. The problem with a book construction is that um, during lamination, the cores can slip out of alignment. That's the biggest issue with the core construction. So it's not... Core may slip... Out of alignment. So it can move a little bit. Yes. So if you have a four-layer board and this is core one, two, and this is core... Three, four. So then when you drill... Yeah, so one, two might go this way, three, four might go that way. And then you can't find the best drill area. If it slips too much, imagine if you have a 10-layer board, 
all your cores are going to slip a little bit. So it becomes much harder to find the true center of all the intersection of all the layers, all the images. And if you if you would like to do the very thin uh, dielectricum, then it's usually done through prep rank, or you can have also very thin core, you can like have, 75 micron. Yes, you can do thin cores. So let's say you know layer four or five is a thin core. Uh, you can absolutely do that. The problematic part of that is number one etching, because the uh, it could get caught in the machine. The second thing is that because it's thinner it could scale, the, that particular core will scale differently to the other cores. So not only can the cores slip out of alignment, they can also scale differently. So meaning um, the image itself can shrink at different rates. Okay. So if you have a three mil core and then the rest of your stack up is, let's say, six mil cores, or five mil cores, or four mil cores, those materials, those layers will move differently than the three mil core. The three mil core might shrink a lot faster. So basically, if you design stack up, then all the cores, ideally, you would like to have same thickness. Ideal would be all same thickness. Now, the way to get around that, to resolve that, is you process what's called a first article through your facility. So now you know how every layer shrinks and scales. Then you go back and start over, and you scale everything now ah, okay. to the perfection of what you just before taught, the production. Before the production. So then. Now the three mil core should shrink to what you want. Um, even though it shrinks at a different rate, it'll still shrink to what you want compared to the other cores. So this machine here, this measures how much the cores have moved inside the board. This one? Yeah. And how do you know how it measures the... In x-rays. So there's a fiducial inside the board. And so it will x-ray inside the board to see where is that marking. And they, they should be on top of each other? And they should be, yes, exactly. And so, well, no, not these two. But as you x-ray inside, you get the idea of the scaling. Of how off are they, are they each, each layer. And so once you get that, then you scale, you find your best center hole. So if this annular ring for layer two, three, moves this way and this annular ring for three, four moves this way, now you find the intersection of that Venn diagram to where you drill your final hole. I found this very interesting because uh, this could be one of the reasons why PCB manufacturers are so persistent when they, when they would like to change your stack up uh, if you are moving your production from different PCB manufacturers. And there are situations when you design and manufacture your first board with uh, one PCB manufacturer and then you decide to move production to different PCB manufacturer and suddenly uh, they would like you to change the stack up and uh, they try to convince you, uh, I don't know, use their materials and these kind of things and it's, it's quite complicated sometimes. And I believe it may be because, you know, these PCB manufacturer, they know exactly how the materials which they use, how this material behaves. The other manufacturer, they may be using different materials and they know how this material behaves. They don't want to go through all these procedures where they try to find out how it is going to scale or something like this. Yeah. So be careful when you are designing stack up, you really would like to use probably the most standard materials. Uh, usually if they can manufacture it in China, then usually this stack up can be manufactured almost everywhere. If you design very specific stick up with specific uh, materials, you may have problem moving your production between different PCB manufacturers. The other clip is very short. Uh, I'm not going to speak about it. Uh, just watch it and then uh, I will explain. Uh, plain, plain areas, this area sometimes very, very narrow. This was a very short clip, but straight to the point. When I draw power planes, I always make uh, this uh, gap, this clearance or distance between the planes wider than is the minimum clearance on the board. And I do it, uh, one of the reasons why I do it is because uh, I read in uh, some design guides that it helps uh, reduce the noise between the power planes. 
And as you can see, the other reason why you would like to keep this uh, space wide is because of PCB manufacturing. The problem with very thin uh, space is uh, etching. If this is very, very thin, then it's quite complicated to remove the copper between the planes. So that's why they need to do it in the PC production a little bit wider. So it's easier to remove the copper. What is also important is the thickness of this copper. Thicker the copper is, the wider this gap needs to be. Okay, so keep this in your mind. Next clip is about uh, thermal relief. Is there something special about this uh, thermal, thermal relief? Yes, yeah. thermal, uh, you should have a 5 mm ring and um, uh, at least 8 mm the, the clearance to clearance. 8 mm clearance. Yeah, spoke gap. Okay. Spoke gap in this one is a 10 mm. 10 mm the thickness of the truck. Mil. 8 to 10 mm. Yeah. Hmm. Notice the numbers. Yeah. 5 mm. 8 mil, 8 to 10 mils. Because next time when you will be using thermal relief in your board, you will know what are the minimum numbers which you can use there. But the next clip is very interesting. People say that they don't do 90 degree scorers because they cause problems during PCB manufacturing. Is this true? Like because of etching of the right angle of PCB no, makes it, I don't know what. That's not true. You talking about the trace? Yeah. Uh, yeah, they don't do that. That's why he's asking. You talking about this? Yes. Yeah. Chamfer. Yeah, I would like that chamfer. Because it will crack, I think. It, it, crack. it will crack? Yeah, it will crack. So if you... That's why you uh, would like to have a 90... But he's not I mean, talking like about crack. flex boards. He's talking about rigid no, boards. No, rigid board. Flex jobs. Flex job, you would like to have radius. Yeah. On the junction. And you think on the rigid it's going to crack too? Yes. Okay. It may. That's All why right. they uh, designers do yeah. that. Okay. I had to ask. Yeah. You know, there are so many discussions on the internet about this uh, 45 versus 90 degree topic. You know, if you can uh, route your tracks with 90 degree corners. And uh, now it's solved. Yeah. You don't need to think about EMI, EMC impedance mismeasure, I don't know what else, just from the PCB point of view, PCB manufacturing point of view, uh, you don't want to route your tracks with 90 degree corners because it may crack. And uh, especially if the track uh, is very thin or uh, if uh, your PCB is going to be exposed to some kind of stress, like thermal stress, or if it can bend or something, you really don't want to use 90 degree corners. I never use 90 degree corners, but you know, I was curious, so I asked. In the next video, you are going to see uh, a line where uh, PCB uh, is etched when the copper is removed from the PCB. And we are going to speak about uh, small copper areas, copper dots on, uh, on the PCB, which uh, you can sometimes see. So have a look. about these dots I wanted to ask so these dots what we seen they were directly on the PCB or the PCB no. was only the small part yeah PCB was only the small okay thing. and when yeah. design so dots are what we add and they will not go on the PCB okay and uh, if someone if an engineer is designing a PCB would you recommend to place this no. we'll take care of that so you would place it even but not in his board that's what I'm asking yeah no there's no need to put it in his board even if there is only like uh, very few copper if, or the, if there's a, let's, if it's an extreme example let's say it's a 10 layer board and all the layers are one ounce copper and they're like ground core and then all of a sudden there's one layer that has only one thin trace right then you should add some copper 
So it doesn't bend or why? Yeah, for warpage, for scaling again. Right? The more copper you have left over, the more rigid that core is. If you have only a little bit of copper, now the core is not as rigid and the material can move wherever it wants to. So more copper means more, um, less movement. Did you catch how the small dots are called? Because I, I played the video a couple of times and, and I everything what I hear is ceiling. And when I Google for PCB ceiling, I, I can't find anything. So if, uh, if you know how exactly these dots on the PCB are called, uh, could you leave me a comment, please? So, you know, I learn new word. <laughs> Thank you very much. In the next video, we are going to speak about prep break, uh, about the uh, thermal stress and also about baking PCBs. Have a look. This is the material that melts during lamination to glue the cores together. And so you notice there's dates on here because if you don't use the material right away, it's going to flow differently or it might even expire. It's like bad, fruit, bad food in your fridge. If you don't eat it, yeah, it's like it'll expire. Half year or what is it? Yeah, this is six months. So within that period, you have to use it for yeah. manufacturing, otherwise yeah. it's going to go. Otherwise, it won't give you a reliable uh, circuit board. When it gets to the final uh, inspection area, we dip the board into hot solder pot. If the board separates, we know there's a problem. Okay, so here, by the way, is our solder, or just solder floats. So you literally dip it into a some solder, hot solder, okay. and that's your thermal stress. And so if there's any separation of the layers, we'll find out before assembly. Because you don't want to send your boards to assembly and find out that they're separating. I've, yeah. I've seen this kind of board. Yeah. So it means something went bad. Something yeah. in the board fabrication was bad. The other part, which is very interesting, is that assembly shops, they're supposed to bake the boards before they assemble. And they oftentimes don't do that. Really? Yeah. So if you put a board through with moisture inside of it, uh, and that happens normally, then the boards can separate. It doesn't mean the boards are bad. It means that the assembly shop didn't bake their boards. So when we do our fabrication and assembly close together, there's no need to bake the boards. Uh, we're just when, when do you need to bake it? When it's, uh, More when than 24 it's hours. Okay. More than 24 hours, the board's sitting around, you should bake them before you assemble it. Because of the humidity. Moisture. Yeah, the humidity. The moisture gets trapped inside and that's it. So, baking and thermal stress, yeah? I know exactly what thermal stress means because I'm going through one right now. It's here like 200 degrees. It's so hot, but uh, I will do it. I will finish this video for you. No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm not kidding. It's really hot here. In the next clip, we are going to speak about drilling and um, I think this information is quite interesting. That's why I included the clip. Have a look. So if you have a two layer board, the first thing we do is we'll take your uh, core, go drill it, and then we image and etch it around the drill. When you have a multi-layer board, you image and etch all the inner layer cores, you laminate the outer layers, which are foil, and it essentially looks like a two-layer board now. And then you go to drilling, and you drill it, and you go and image and etch the outer. Drilling is always before the imaging. So you can image around the drill, yeah. What do you think why I included this clip in this video? It's because uh, I believe many people, they already try to make their own PCBs at home. And when you are making PCB at home, uh, then uh, the first step what you do is you do the imaging. You put the motif on the top of your PCB, then you do the etching, you remove the copper, and as the last step, you do the drilling. And then you may never ever think that in a real PCB production, these steps, they may be actually in different order. Yeah? And that's the reason why I included the, the clip, because I think it, it's interesting. In the next video, we are going to speak about uh, mask 
over vias. So always when I uh, do, when I place vias, I always cover them with the mask. And uh, I ask a question that if we need to take some special care about uh, this situation, because I've seen some boards, I've seen some people making a small hole inside the vias. So that's what is the next video about. Some people, for example, they, they uh, speak about putting the mask on the vias and they are worried that uh, when this kind of PCB goes into the assembling process uh, and if the vias are, uh, you know, filled with this uh, solder mask, it can explode or something to do some... Yeah, that's true. Do, do we need to take special care of this uh, mask? Do we need to put there the hole in the mask for the vias or you do it here or oh, how it is done? Oh, interesting. Um, if you coat the, it's called a, let's say, uh, coating your solder mask over all your vias. If you do that, there will automatically be a hole in the vias. So you automatically put it here? Uh, it just happens because the mask is not thick enough. So it just flow yeah, inside the via. Yeah. So if you, when you squeegee the mask, um, when you're, by the time you're done with the process, there will be holes, always. holes in the mask. So just to confirm, I always cover the whole vias. I always cold the whole vias. I never do any small holes inside the vias and we never had any problems. In the next video, I really had to ask because uh, many people, they don't know how uh, boards are assembled if components are from both sides, from the top and from the bottom. So here is the answer. Assemble the backside first. The because there are smaller components usually? Let's, let's just say, but it's not necessary. You can assemble any side you want to first, and then you uh, don't run it through the oven yet. You flip it over and then you assemble the other side, let's say the top side, and then you run it through the oven. So you run it only once? Through only the... once through the oven, twice through the pick and place machine. How do you know that the components are not going to fall off? Uh, surface tension, they really don't fall off. They never? They never fall off. The solder has... Unless you have like some huge, you know, special inductor humongous or something. And then you glue it or something. And then you do it by hand after. Ta -ta -da -da. And the secret was revealed. And now everybody knows that uh, if you have components from two sides of PCB, they only go into oven once. In the next video, we are going to speak about the uh, minimum distance between two holes and uh, what can happen if they are too close to each other. And we are going to use a new word, plating. I'm pretty sure many people, they already know what this means. If you, if you don't know, then plating is the process when copper is uh, put inside the vias. Yeah? So when they play the PCB, they are putting the copper inside the holes. So here is the next video. Does it mean holes too close to each other? Uh, the holes, when you drill two holes? Yeah, I know what... So drill the copper. But what is it? Um, what's huh? the problem? Well, how, how close is too close? Uh, eight mils apart is standard. You know, if it's any closer than eight, it's non-standard anymore. So if we have any sort of drill wander, um, then you could have shorts. If everything's okay, um, but you put the board through some strenuous testing, what, uh, something called cath happens, where copper actually grows through the material and connects two holes together. Really? Yeah, really. Okay, I need to somehow mark this. That's interesting. We can tell you about cap later. But... I, I thought it's too close because, I don't know, it's too dangerous to drill too close. So that's not the reason. reason is plating. Plating. When you drill a hole, there's microfractures in the material. And when you plate it, the plating solution goes into the microfractures. And if you have two holes that are really close together, with microfractures, it... the copper can wick all the way and connect those holes together. Yeah. 
this was really interesting even i didn't know i saw you cannot drill holes close to each other because uh, because of uh, tolerance or because uh, you can break the space between the holes or something like this i wasn't really never thinking about the micro fractures inside the hole wow in the next video uh, you will see a machine which can uh, compare gerber files with real pcb i really love this machine that's why i include in the video have a look this is aoi automated optical inspection so we're comparing the uh, edged panel to the Gerber data from the upper left of the Gerber data and then you see the actual edge oh that's interesting image. so if the electrical test says oh there's a connection but we actually etched the trace too far down this machine will catch that the trace width is outside of tolerance so you only check the most critical places or whole piece of everything it goes like every single trace every wow single trace. this is good this is really good awesome i think it's really awesome that uh, they have the machine which can compare the real pcb with the design which uh, you done yeah with the gerber files that that can give you quite uh, you know the additional confidence that uh, they check all the tracks they check all the width and everything in the next video we are going to speak about uh, micro via plating and two hole plating and uh, when i was speaking about plating uh, a couple of minutes ago i uh, i say it's the process when you put the copper inside the via but during this process you actually put copper everywhere yeah not only inside the vias that's important to know in the first part of the video you will see the laser drilling machine you will see their flashing and uh, i ask uh, about this uh, v shape of the micro vias it always has to be this v shape because the process of plating micro vias is different comparing to the process of plating the true hole vias when they plate these micro vias the solution it needs to flow inside the micro via that's why there is this v shape okay uh, but let's watch the video so you understand the, the procedure of the plating the micro vias and the true hole vias here it is does the laser always drill through or it can only uh, drill up to a certain depth? Yeah. Laser, laser can drill any depth. The problem is the plating. So if you want to plate a laser hole, which is only open on one side, like a blind via, then what we do is uh, you have to follow the aspect ratio, aspect ratio of your plating pin. Uh, yeah, the, the, the solution, solution flow. Yes, exactly. So you plate it first for the micro vias and then you plate it again? Yes. And what happens? It doesn't flow inside the true hole vias? Or it doesn't we, go? We cover. We cover the true hole vias. Wow. How? Uh, <laughs> with a uh, resist. So you just put the resist inside the... It's, uh, we... Ah, you put it there and then you would clean it again or something? Yeah, we put the full resist and then we develop off just the micro vias. Ah. And so now you have all these little... Only those. Only those go into the plating tank and get filled with copper. Then we remove that resist, put down another resist and expose just the through holes. Wow. And if you know a better way, let me know. <laughs> Yeah, when you when you do the yeah, so the second process of when you put the mask again, you're covering the micro vias that only you've micro vias. plated. Yeah. Okay. And then the other stuff gets plated up with the through holes. It really was actually interesting because uh, this uh, what you could see it was only small part of the discussion. You know, I asked them questions how 
how they actually do it because uh, when you just do the plating of uh, the micro vias and then in the second step you do the plating of the through hole vias if this plating is not covering itself or if there are no holes between these uh, platings uh, it was really interesting yeah but uh, it's already like a 40 minute video so let's move to the next uh, clip and it's going to be about coupons and then there is only one more clip a very short clip and we are almost done so here is the clip about the coupons so this is where you check the this is where we, uh, we use the probe and we check we check a coupon so we use this probe yeah i remember this probe and then we use it yeah we use the probe and then you place coupons on yeah so in this case what we have is uh, we have these coupons oh. where we can they, that mimics the board itself and then with those coupons we can mimic here you know, these these are all the coupons that we use to cross section those holes okay so now if you look at if you look at this panel right um, there is a factor of making circuit boards which is the utilization of the material if you look at this panel you could easily fit another four boards here but you can't because we have impedance coupons and we have these cross section coupons all along the sides. Now, with a less expensive board facility, they're not going to put all those coupons there. And so they'll get an extra four boards here. Right? And cross section coupons, it means they are used for what? The exact what I was showing you. How much copper is in the hole? Ah, uh, okay. How much material? Ah, okay. So between. these are the holes are that the, you cut? Yes. And yes. you cut them in each corner? Yes, because this is the different directions of the material so the grain direction of the material actually matters so again some people they try to put these coupons on the pcb it's Not you good. do it yeah we do it Not you good. you already have it in libraries in everywhere yeah. and you just and our, you know exactly software, how it should look our software creates the coupon on the fly based on your design awesome so you don't have to worry that's about. important to know so Definitely, if you don't have to, or if, if engineers don't have to, do not place the uh, PCBs into panel. Just say, I would like to have four PCBs, two by two, and that's enough. And that's it, yeah. Now, this coupon right here for impedance, if you order a board with control impedance, then we put this on the panel and we measure it and make sure that we're shipping with intolerance. If you just send us control dielectrics, or you plan for certain thicknesses, we don't put this coupon and we don't measure. So you're gonna get whatever ends up happening. We're not accountable for that ohms on the board. So that's the difference between ordering control impedance versus not. You can still get what you're looking for with controlled dielectrics, but you know, you're know you just not getting that certification and that extra test. I mentioned these uh, coupons because uh, I remember the times when uh, in some of my projects I placed the boards into panel and I created all these coupons around the panel. I, I really remember drawing these impedance coupons and placing there the test points. You can see it's not necessary. In the PCB company they have their own tools, they have their own uh, probes, they have the software which generates exactly the coupons what they need so you don't have to do it and in the last video we are going to speak about the about the factors what influence the price of the pcb the most here it is mechanical drill bit size and the number of laminations those two things drive the cost you could hear it yeah mechanical drill bit size it means the smallest minimum hole on your pcb and number of laminations that's uh, how many times your pcb has to go into oven to glue the core and prep and fold together yeah simple multi-layer pcbs they go into the oven only once they, they only have one lamination but the 
the kind of PCBs what we normally design, they go there three times. So it makes the PCB more expensive. I really hope you found this video useful. I hope you learned something new. If you like this video and uh, you have uh, any questions or there is something what you still would like to see how they do it in PC production, leave the comment, okay? What is very important, uh, like this video because uh, if uh, there is uh, many likes on the video, uh, we can do maybe some other videos inside the Sierra Circuit Company and uh, answer all the other questions which you can have. Possibly, if you would like to see similar video but from assembling process, they do the assembly in Sierra Circuit too. So again, if you like this video, if they can see that uh, the you know people watch it, maybe we can record videos also about the assembling. So thank you very much for watching. Uh, I, I really hope you enjoyed the video and uh, see you later or see you next time. <laughs>